Hey foodies, on this episode we are speaking to neuroscientist Dr. Latasia Jones. She is the first African American to earn her PhD from the Department of Biomedical Sciences in the College of Medicine at Florida State University. She is a lecturer, if then ambassador, and more. She is committed to making sure that children, especially young girls, have a role model to look up to in the world of science, technology, engineering, and math. Please pull up your seat and stay tuned to this episode of There's Food in the House. Ooh, if it's lit, then I'm signing up. I just knock them down, Adrian can line them up. If you search for real talk, then you're finding us. Thanks for reminding us, ain't no wild shining up, it's different. I know you're feeling something missing. Them shows only talk, they don't listen. You need something warm, like a hot meal from the south. Like a summer rain in a drought. Some real talk, that can make a nigga proud. Thoughts out loud, we ain't doing it for the clout. That food for the soul, gotta take a different route. You don't need nothing fast, we got food at the house. I'm just saying though. We get food at the house. Yeah, we get food at the house. Hey everyone, it's your girl Adrienne, a PR diva, coming to you live again from There's Food in the House. You know, this is the podcast where you don't have to ask anybody else for anything or look for anything else because we have food in the house. So today I am excited to share some black girl magic with you, some black girl STEM magic from this doctor who, when I read her bio, y'all, I was like, she studied, huh? What is this? <laughs> So this, we are going to speak with Dr. Latasia Jones. Dr. Jones, welcome to There's Food in the House. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. You are very welcome. I was stalking your page. I had hesitated. <laughs> through and I look for people who I feel like will be a great fit who have stories and so you make STEM and science fun so I was like okay well I want to have fun with some STEM and some science so let's talk about it so you are a doctor let's start there so we have this black girl doctor magic on the show is being a doctor what you wanted to be all your life is that what you wanted to do when you grew up Originally, I wanted to be an obstetrician gynecologist, so MD versus a PhD. Um, I started school with that as the main goal, and then my freshman year, I saw a flyer up that said, hey, if you want to get some laboratory experience at the College of William & Mary, at this time, I was at Virginia State University, which is my alma mater for bachelor's and master's. Okay. I saw the flyer up and it said, if you want this internship for College of William & Mary to work in a lab over the summers apply here, but they were only looking for upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. So I found the person that was responsible for putting up the flyer. And after, I, I, I think I was kind of badgering him over and over <laughs> and over. But if we use our formal words and our more professional words, I was being persistent. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and eventually it came down to either nobody would fill the space because nobody else was interested or this freshman myself, you know, would be able to fill that opportunity. So I was granted the opportunity to work in a lab and I loved it so much that I completely changed my major to wow. pursuing a STEM career. I, I still didn't know exactly what, but that's where it started from. That's where I started working more in labs and I all together, that was 2007. So I've been working in the lab since 2007. That is so fun. See, people can't say that grassroots marketing and organic marketing doesn't work because these flyers work. You know? <laughs> they do. They do, definitely. So that is so cool. So you, what was so different for you? What did you feel was so different from the learning for PhD and MD? Right. So, I mean, my thing has always been passion filled. Mm. I didn't realize that until maybe more recently, maybe in the last two, three years, that everything that I do is usually guided by my passion. And my passion is usually kid-oriented, trying to advance whatever I'm doing and protecting, helping, assisting kids to live longer and healthier. So it didn't matter if I went the MD track or the PhD track because I could still find that passion within that particular path. And I didn't, like I said, I didn't know that at the beginning. And I realized that more and more as I kept going down the stream of, you know, working towards a PhD. And even even at the beginning, I didn't realize I wanted to get a PhD. I continued my research and graduated my bachelor's and my master's at Virginia State University, worked on two whole projects at that point, and then I went to Ghana. And I taught some students in Ghana, and I realized while I was teaching them the science, I utilized some, you know, fun hands-on activities 
that help them and encourage them to want to be more into learning what they were supposed to be learning for their curriculum. And that's when I realized, hey, I don't want to stop here. Like, I know I'm getting my master's soon, but I don't want to stop at this point. I want to be able to, I, I call it being the boss. Like, you want, I want to be able to run my own show. I want to start creating these opportunities without people saying, hey, she may not have the credentials. So what's the best way to do that? Add doctor's money. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so that, made, that encouraged me to get that PhD, and I applied for schools to pursue it at, and the best place for me was at Florida State University. And then five years later, graduated as the first African-American to graduate from my program. So uh, can we get some claps for that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is so dope. Congratulations on that. That is, wow, that's nice. But that's so, I, I bring that story up because I always talk about how my passion kind of just led me. It, yes, it wasn't yeah. me dictating where I wanted to be. It was me allowing the things that made me and encouraged me to keep going to drive me towards that direction. So sometimes you got to let go of the rain and let that drive you. And that's so, I love when people bring that up because I've had a couple of guests come on and they are either passion driven or happiness driven, which go hand in hand because yeah. you want to be happy. And as long as you allow your happiness, your passion to, to mold you and guide you, it has to work out. Absolutely. I, I agree. And so you said you work in STEM. So share with us a little bit about STEM, how it works and how that aligns with your passion? Okay, so my first project, my intern at College of William & Mary was looking at microscopic worms and understanding cellular division. So how cells divide and if there's any abnormalities, what's happening to make this cellular division go wrong. And then I realized the impact of that went towards tumor growth, cancers, and so on. Um, And then as I kept going, I started doing a type of diabetes model research at Virginia State University for my master's project. And of course, that's a big thing for minorities. So then I realized the impact of my research when it came to my own people or people like myself that have these higher risk factors when it comes to those types of disparities. And as I went into my PhD tenure, I completely switched gears and I didn't think this would ever happen, but I went into neuroscience. And I keep saying this, but my neuroscience project was to help out kids that had this onset disease called levodopa responsive dystonia, which in, in short, it means they're not able to control their muscles mm. like a regular person is able to. So kids that are running and for, playing sports and riding a bike, they're basically unable to do those things because their body is being pushed into these irregular positions, kind of like a double jointed person. Okay. But a double jointed person does it on purpose. These kids, are their bodies are doing it on by themselves. So it's painful and it's pushing them into these positions that they don't, they don't want to be when they'd rather be, you know, playing basketball, kicking a ball or going down a slide. Wow. So I studied neuroscience to understand what was going on and what abnormalities were occurring. I even created an antibody to basically detect what was going on in a particular family wow. and why they were, they were having this onset of this disease occurring on a childhood, childhood level. And that basically translated into me moving here to the D.C. area, working at Children's National and working on autism spectrum disorders doing the same thing, looking at abnormalities and proteins and whether or not these things were occurring in autism as well in the brain for kids. Wow. So you are doing great work. <laughs> like, like <laughs> great work. And, and I mean, it's obviously so needed and so necessary. And so I know that you share some, some of your work with Fun Day with Dr. Tay and, and you do Dr. Yes. Tay. So how did you come about that? Because I've seen and then you use obviously current music. I've seen your YouTube page where you use songs that our children are singing to make (laughs) science fun. So how did you come up with that? And what goes into your videos? Or what are you thinking about when you make your videos? Well, okay, so I started a long time ago, even before I went to Ghana and was teaching the kids, I've always been big on committing to serving my community. And then it just became bigger and bigger and bigger as time has gone by. But recently, that's what I brought up earlier, about three years ago, I sat down with a professor at NIH, and I was in the middle of trying to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And she said, well, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. And although I have this great research ability and these great research credentials I presented domestically, internationally, I have a PhD off of research, (laughs) made an antibody, 
I still had no way of connecting my research to what I want to do later on in life, which is mm. continuing to educate the youth, making sure, because I didn't have a role model that looked like myself now when I was a kid. So my big passion is to say, hey, I'm going to prevent that from happening to the kids that are here today. I want them to have a role model that looks like me. And it just so happened. I'm young. So right. it's easy for me to like catch up with the trends and use the trends because I'm still like, I mean, although I'm in my 30s now, I graduated my PhD before I turned 30. Nice. So, you know, I, I'm still very connected to the younger generations. I like to keep connected to them because that's the only way to be able to teach them and influence them is if mm-hmm. you come down to their level on use some of the fun activities, but also to show them that scientists aren't the stereotypical scientists. I grew up thinking Bill Nye, the science guy, was the only <laughs> way. If you look like him and you did things like him, that's the only way you're going to become a scientist. And now right. I'm showing kids hey, you could look like Dr. Latasia Jones. And <laughs> sometimes she wears dresses, she can have afro, she can have this hairstyle, she can be dancing on your page to having a YouTube channel and still she's just doing her thing and trying to teach you science at the same time. <laughs> and so when you are around the children and you use this, so what is the feedback that you get from them and how receptive are they to learning once they come to your page or once you do programming with the children, how do they mm-hmm. About and how are they receptive to that? They love it. They love it. The first thing is shock, right? Because you're having somebody tell you that they are an African-American female scientist. And as they've been working in science for 13, 14 years, and they still look like, I do pass for my 20s sometimes. <laughs> you, so, you can. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a shocker for a lot of them because a lot of them still haven't heard or seen those types of examples. So that's the first thing to get past, right? And then once they get past that, it's like, oh, actually, I kind of like what she has, you know, planned for us. This fun hands-on activity that's teaching us something, but I don't even realize I'm learning because I'm having fun doing whatever I'm doing. So that's usually the reactions I get from it. And like I said, keeping up with the trend. I, I actually don't like hearing my voice and I don't like recording on a video or doing anything live, but really? I use, yes, <laughs> nobody believes that, but that's the, like I said, that's the only way to get in touch with the youth is to come and do the things that they're doing. Yep. And that's what sparked me to start my YouTube channel, especially now I have a program called Young Scientist Wednesdays at Children's National Hospital, where I teach the patients there because it's all kids, I teach the patients their science through fun hands-on activities. Well, because of the virus right now, it's closed everything down, and I'd rather not be in contact with any kids that could be vulnerable just to keep them safer than, you know, if I was to be in contact with them. So I started the YouTube channel because this is a perfect time to do it. Everybody's at home. The kids are at home. You know, the hospitals are on lockdown, and YouTube can be played anywhere. So it allows me to do these things. I'm, I'm literally teaching everybody's science from my kitchen without using supplies that you can't find in your house. I'm using like hydrogen peroxide, vegetable oil, water, eggs, you know, anything and everything you can find in your house to keep you safe and having from having to like leave your house to get these Mm -hmm. things. But not only is it teaching the kids something, but the parents have a avenue to teach their kids something as well. And all these things can be found at the house. That's so cool. That is amazing. And I know you mentioned the virus and we are on lockdown and I've unfortunately read some stories of adverse reactions that the children are having to being locked in and away from their friends. So from a scientific perspective, how do you feel children can engage with their family members if, you know, like their friends aren't around or, or other things that they can do to help them while we're in this quarantine? So that's a good question. Um, I think regardless of anything, it's going to be a big change for the kids, right? Because it, we, at the ages, the younger ages, especially, we're pushing them towards that social interaction. And now we're saying, don't interact physically, socially, but use like social media, your phones, your computers and stuff. Where for be, uh, maybe a few weeks ago, we were saying, hey, I wish the kids would be less on social media. <laughs> Put and the phones more- down. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, you know, I think I think that's the big thing. Now we have to switch it back and say, oh, it's okay for now because I still want you to engage. I want you to be mentally healthy. And because isolation can, you know, be detrimental for the mental stability of not only adults, but for kids too. We're social beings, most of us at least. Mm-hmm. So, right. you know, that interaction, I, I, so the YouTube channel is great, but it allows people to have their flexibility in watching it with, amongst whomever 
and have that interaction with a group of people. I also, this week, I'm working with the Boys and Girls Club and doing a live experiment with them, and they're going to have all their kids on the Zoom meeting doing the live experiment with me as, you know, I'm here at home and they're at their own homes too. So, you know, we just have to be a little bit more creative and open to the things that we shut down in the past that interaction on, you know, technology, technological devices, just being a little open to that again. Um, and then just talking to each other and making sure that things are transparent because even myself, I'm a very, ext- I'm an extrovert. Like I love that interaction and I've had to talk more about the fact that this is killing me. Cabin fever is getting to me. <laughs> you know, I need more to do. I need more interaction, but I want to be safe and I want everybody else to be safe as well. So I just find little creative ways to get those, that interaction or that, you know, value back to my life. And so being an extrovert, that's an interesting point because I want to ask being a female black scientist, if this were not your passion, path is there something else that you would have wanted to be when you grew up or where else would you see yourself if you weren't a scientist to be honest with you there's so many other things that I probably could have I do I do hair I love doing hair so I probably could have been in cosmetology somewhere um and I look back now and I say oh you I probably could have worked as a nurse as well but I'm, I'm glad I'm glad how I'm glad about the results of my path and my journey more so than ever because I, 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 mean, I ask myself this all the time. I had a, and I use this as an example. I had a boyfriend my prom year of high school. Mm-hmm. I went into college still trying to continue that relationship. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of friction because he didn't understand me being at school and dedicating more focus on school versus being able to come home and, you know, have that flexibility and so on. And there's been mo- a lot of different, I wouldn't say distractions, but uh, relationships and situations that came into my path along the way that I had to sacrifice Mm -hmm. because of where I didn't realize I was going, but where I had fun and was motivated to go. So I, if I had to do it again, I would still be the person that has 13, 14 years of science experience. And it's just been so many things. I'm so young, but I've done some, I've gone (laughs) to Germany on a grant to present you know, my research, I have nice. graduated. What if I didn't do any of these things? What if I didn't go to Ghana and say, hey, I want to pursue a PhD? I may have not ever interviewed or applied for a PhD program, which could have led to me not being the first African-American to graduate and earn my PhD from the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Florida State University. So there's so many things that I could say, hey, maybe I, if I would have done this versus this, da 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 da, da but I, I would not. I wouldn't turn. I wouldn't change it all. <laughs> I wouldn't change that's, it all. That's so awesome because I want you to speak to that person who, because I'm, I'm sure that situation happens more often than not then you know as teenagers young adults when we get that first relationship that first love we just know like this is the person that we're going to be with forever and I think it was great for you to be able to say I need to focus on school I don't know where school might eventually take me but I know that school is what I need to do so if there's someone who is struggling right now with saying I want you to understand you know we can potentially still be together, but I want you and I need you to understand that this is what I want to do. Like, how can you help someone work through that? I I will always just say, put yourself first, put yourself first Mm -hmm. and make sure you surround yourself by people that are going to make sure you're putting yourself first. My, my number one cheerleaders are my mother, my sister, and of course, God. So Mm -hmm. going to my religious standing and then having my family back me on, you know, these hard decisions has always been the best place the best things that I've done to keep me in the right place. Um, my mom and my sister always reinforce anything. They're like, okay, but you didn't, we didn't, they, they use these phrases. They know they don't mean it, but they mean it somewhat. <laughs> they, they've been the phrase I, I was with you shooting in the gym. They really have been with me shooting in the gym. Okay. So my mom and my sister, if, if I try to like just relax on talking um, you know, more relaxed and less intellectually. <laughs> They'll say, we didn't put you through school for 11 plus years for you to be talking like that, you know? So <laughs> they always put me back in place. You, did, you didn't come this far to quit. So it's not going to happen because of a boyfriend or because of any situation. I've gone through deaths in the family. 
I had a, a death in my family one week before my last requirement that allowed me to defend my dissertation. Oh, wow. And if I would have pushed it back, I wouldn't have been able to defend on time or probably would never defend it at all. I had a, I was engaged during my PhD tenure and found out my fiance was committing fraud, you know, so oh, no. <laughs> I've gone through a lot of stuff and it could have stopped me, but instead of me allowing myself to be you know, at that stagnant stage and not continuing with what I was set to do without these people or with these people or with these, with it, without these interruptions, I just kept going. So mm -hmm. definitely talking to that, those family members and putting myself first are the most important things that I've, I've always kept to. And it's, it's gotten me here. So I'm not going to deviate from that <laughs> at all. <laughs> right. That's awesome. So what are some tips? So you figured out science is, is something that you love. So what were some key things about science that you could potentially share with people who don't necessarily, like you, didn't know science was where you wanted to go, but these were things that intrigued you and, and engaged you to say, okay, well, let me look at this a little more. Are there things that you could share with people about science that really get you and keep you motivated about science? Right. So I'll, I'll share you with you my top three. Um, one would be about the opportunity. Second one would be about the things that I've learned and never thought I'd be able to do. And then the third one would be how it's shaping my future. So with the opportunities portion, I have presented at over 20 conferences and meetings. And a lot of these times when you're presenting the grants that your project is funded off of, it pays for your transportation, it pays for your hotel, it pays for your food, gives you like a per diem for food and taking care of those costs as well. So I didn't have to depend on myself for these things. And I still was able to go to Germany and present or go to, at the time I was in Florida, I've gone to Chicago, D.C., before I moved to D.C., of course, and, you know, just other places to present my work. And then on top of that, having collaborative collaborations with other people allows you to go to their labs and work in their labs. So I, I have a collaboration with Boston Mass General Hospital when I was working on my Ph.D. in Florida. And at any given time, if I didn't know a technique, they would fly me out there and have me stay there for a few weeks nice. so I could learn that technique to put into my PhD project. So it's a very supportive and collaborative atmosphere that grants you these opportunities. The second one, I think I was saying, was what I've learned along the way. I would, if you were to ask me, Latasia, on your freshman year, did you think you were going to be doing anything related to my research or you know, <laughs> working in a lab for 10 plus hours because you just love it or anything else or creating an antibody to help childhood disorders do you think you would be able to you would ever do that and my answer would be no absolutely not it, it, i tell my story every day how i literally do c-sections on pregnant mice in order to manipulate dna and put it in the embryo so i could study the brain wow development of children based on a mouse model of a kid a small baby mouse so you know these are things I would never have imagined doing my freshman year and I've learned through all of these experiences and this, this exposure to these different types of experiments have made me a bigger and greater scientist and then the last thing I said is it's, it's building my future because of these experiences I realized like I said my passion and my ability to teach science to different audiences uh, across the world or across age groups and across minorities or whatever else and I love the fact that I'm able to do that so much that it encourages me to find other ways of doing that and I like the YouTube channel and being a role model to mentoring organizations and so on. I travel and do public speaking engagements. I've done it at college universities to high schools to middle schools. And I've even done it at elementary schools for the career days. So there's no gap in what I can do now, which excites me the most. So I, to bring this up, I um, applied for a AAAS, it's an ambassadorship, which is, it was started by Lida Hill Philanthropies. And her goal was to highlight women in STEM that are already serving as role models and give them bigger platforms to continue to do the same thing. So that way we can encourage girls to pursue careers in STEM. Mm -hmm. And that has taken me to a different level. That it's exposed me to keeping up with the times when it comes to being in touch with youth, to celebrating me. They're, they're building 
full grown, full like body statues of oh. each ambassador and they're going to put it, the first plot of land they're going to put it in is in Dallas, North Dallas. If you were to ask me that any of those things would ever <laughs> happen to me <laughs> in my freshman year, I would say no. So back to your uh, question a few questions ago, I would not change anything that I've done. <laughs> it's definitely brought me to a different level in life because I stayed here. I said no to the boyfriends and so on, but I am here and I am creating an impact on my community. I'm making one less child of color, girl of color, not have a role model. She see me as a role model in STEM. And then I bring more people out that's in my network so that she can see them as well and say, hey, there's more role models she can have in STEM. So I definitely wouldn't change anything. That is so awesome. And I can see the passion in it for you. <laughs> I'm sure people listening will be able to hear it because it is so... It's just so dope. It's so dope to yeah. energize about something and, and know that you are on the right path and in, in the lane that you're supposed to be in. Absolutely. This is, I, I can't believe we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this has been an amazing conversation. So, so tell everybody where they can find you, how to follow you, and, and how to get in contact with you. Yeah. Okay, so I am on everything. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. I think that's it. I'm from missing one. But I'm on everything at Tay, Dr. Tay, A-D-Y-B-R-T-A-Y. Um, the spaces or without the spaces, depending on which social media platform you're using. And that's the best way you can find me. If you want to email me, my email is heydrtay at gmail.com. To make it easy, everything is hey, Dr. K. So <laughs> definitely reach out for anything and everything. Um, if you have a creative idea and just can't figure out the full idea, I would love to collaborate with you and speak more with you about it. My thing is about continuing the mission to serve the community. So if you have, you're in the same mindset, then I, I'm glad to work with you. That is so awesome. Well, Dr. Tay, thank you so much for joining us on There's Food in the House. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much.